You you all can walk off if you like. For a few minutes. Back there. Okay. Can I just turn around? Okay, sir, the clap right in front of your face. Very good. Go ahead. My name is Elizabeth Simmons. Today is July 29th, 2008, and we're in Hopkins Park in um, Kankakee County, Illinois. The people I'm interviewing today are John and Ida Thurman. This interview is being conducted as a part of the Illinois State Museum Oral History of Illinois Agriculture Project. Well, first of all, I'd like to say hi to both you and, and uh, John, and um, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your uh, background. Um, John, we'll start with you. Where was your mom, your father, mother and father born at? Um, my mother was born in uh, Cook County uh, in Chicago, and my father, uh, he was born in uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And um, where did they grow up at? Was it, where, was it in those places? or? Uh, my mother, uh, she mostly grew up out here because uh, she stayed with her grandmother uh, early on. Out here, and, you mean like in, right and, here in, right, in, uh, in this area? area. Yeah. Okay. And my father, um, he grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. He was in Madison, Canton. <laughs> he moved around a little. And then in the 40s. Are those counties in Mississippi yes. or cities? Uh, counties. Okay. Well, Madison is Alpha City, too, and yeah. And um, then in the 40s, he moved up here. Okay. And Ida, where were your parents born at? Rankin County. Rankin County? Mm -hmm. Where's that located? It's in uh, Mississippi. Is that near Jackson also? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And growing up, uh, where did they live? They moved to Simpson County. Which is also it's in, in uh, Mississippi. Okay, mm -hmm. and so both of your parents were born in the same place and grew up together, and and um, then they married and and they lived in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, where were you born at? I was born in Simpson County. In Simpson County, mm -hmm. also. So most of your kin are all from Simpson County, then. Right. All right. And how did your family, or just was it you that came up here to Illinois? How did you end up here in Illinois? I married John, and then we moved here. Yeah. Okay, well that's very interesting. So you're born and raised in Simpson County, and John, you're born and raised up here in Chicago area. Yeah. Um, but then you had some uh, family that came out here to Kankakee County. How did the two of you meet? Uh, I was blessed that my father, when, uh, when all the the adult, his adult son, at a certain age, because uh, it's, it's four of us, he decided that uh, we were about marrying age. So he moved the whole family uh, to Mississippi. And I met her going into going to school at McGee. I'll be darn. So McGee was the local high school? Yes. So you two are high school sweethearts? Yes. <laughs> well, that's very nice. And so y'all met and married in, in Mississippi, in Rankin County? Simpson. Simpson. Simpson County. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And um, what year was that that you were all were married in? 77. 1977? Okay. Yes. Um, do you, um, uh, John, do you have other uh, relatives? Or, or you mentioned you've got three other brothers. Uh, what are their names? Uh, Eldridge, William, and Robert. And your father's name is? Roy. Okay. And where are you in the family? Are you the youngest or oldest? I'm the seventh child. You're the seventh child? Yes. Okay. And um, I do, how many are in your family? I have um, three, two older sisters and two older brothers. One of my brothers passed away early on when he was a child. Um, and then I have uh, a younger brother. And where do you fall in that? Are you youngest or oldest? I'm the, the youngest daughter. You're so. the youngest daughter. Okay. And also, um, who else is in your immediate family? Do you have grandmother, grandfathers? Who all are in your family immediately? Uh, now, well, I don't have any of that right now. They're all passed away? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. As well as my mom and my grandma. As well? And my dad. Okay. Um, when you were, uh, Ida, when you were young, did you live in town or on, on a, a farm place like here? Um, we lived not as a farm place, but we visited frequently to, at uh, my grandmother's house. I called her Big Mama. We all called her Big Mama. 
And when my mom would go to work, she worked at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go through the woods. I know it sounds really interesting, but we did. We went to the, through the woods, and we went to Big Mama's house. And so. we stayed there during the daytime while Mama worked. So you actually spent a lot of time at Big Mama's house, and she lived in the country on a farm place. She lived on a farm. Uh, she was a sharecropper type, she, where she worked the farm, uh, doing cotton, peas, cucumbers, and things like that. And she was able to stay there because she worked the farm. Mm -hmm. We helped her with the cotton and the peas and the cucumbers. Oh, so you had a lot of experience with, with those crops early on then as a girl. Yes. Okay. She yeah. also had a garden, her own personal garden, where she preserved food, froze in the freezer mostly. And uh, she would always have uh, some type of livestock which she butchered every fall. So we had with that too. So you definitely got your start early on at Big Mama's house then. Yeah. Now John, you grew up near, closer into the city of Chicago, is that right? Uh, yes, I was actually, I was born in Chicago. Uh, I've been very little time there. Um, my father didn't want to raise uh, any of his kids in the city because he had got a chance to spend a certain amount of time there and he knew it wasn't a good place to rear kids. What were some of the things about the city of Chicago? I mean, because he did go there and stay, but what are some things that he was concerned about or what did he like better about being out here in Kankakee County than Chicago? Uh, he didn't like the closeness because uh, and people are being all stacked up together it was a lot of tension, a lot of stress, and it just wasn't a relaxed atmosphere. And he wanted us to be raised where it was as relaxed as possible. So he felt that the country life was a lot better for yeah. a family. He okay. wanted us to get a chance to build our own traits instead of picking up the stress and the strain that's around us. Now, Ida, we got a little bit of idea what chores you did um, helping Big Mama as a girl because you were out helping her out in the fields and with canning and butchering and all. But John, when you were a boy, what type of chores did you often do, you and your brothers? Uh, our main chore was uh, feeding the hogs. Uh, we had a couple of cows, but mostly we had, uh, we had a lot of hogs. And uh, we also uh, took care of the garden, because my father, uh, he worked with Kankakee Water Company, and, and he farmed. So we took a lot of, well, we were supposed to anyway, take a lot of his slack up. And uh, he gave us all a certain amount of uh, land to raise our own garden on. So he wanted us early to realize uh, from the, from the, how you put it, from the garden to the table, you know. And to so, see that you could, you could raise enough food and, and manage right. on your own. So right. from when you were a boy, you had a lot of experiences directly with raising animals, hogs in this case, and yeah. then also with gardening and, and growing crops. Yes. So were those were your main chores that you had as a boy? Well, uh, well but the, really the main, main was uh, the garden. Because it took uh, pretty much all summer long. Once you plant, you're busy until you, uh, until it's harvest time. And then you really, really get busy. Yeah, you got to harvest <laughs> and put up all that food for the winter. Yes. And now who helped with putting up the food for the winter, John, when you were a boy? Was that something that you boys did or did your parents or mother do that? Well, the funny thing, uh, my father believed that Anything that one, the girls knew, the boys should know. Anything the boys knew, the girls should know. So everybody had their hand in. And uh, we all can cook, clean, and the girls uh, could get out there and toss hay with the best of them. So he was pretty open-minded, your dad was. Yes. Very interesting. Okay. And also, um, were you involved, um, Ida, with the church growing up? Yes. Um, early on, I'm a member of uh, McGee First Baptist Church. It was a family um, type church. And is that in Rankin County, Mississippi? It's in Simpson County. Simpson. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I keep mm -hmm. mixing Simpson and Rankin. Um, McGee, Mississippi. And um, how did that affect your uh, daily life or your family life growing up being a member of that church? Uh, I, I just enjoy the, the, the close atmosphere of family members and, and the gatherings that we had and uh, it was just, it really grounded me early on to, to be the kind of person that I, I've um, grown to be, I would think. Did you have, a, uh, it was, did you feel like it was an environment where, um, since everybody was friends or family, that you could just relax and be yourself? Is that what you Most the, definitely. Okay, so that was very important to you, to uh, your growing up, to learning about how you were and what, what you were all about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And, um... 
John, what did your family have an involvement with the church? And, and if so, what did that do for your family's life? Uh, my father, uh, he tried going to different churches, but uh, he really had this thing where he wanted us raised exactly a certain way. So we did most of ours at home. Uh, we read the Bible, he'd, uh, you know, and he'd go through where we had Bible classes, that type of thing. That way he wanted us, he didn't want us following a, a man on earth, but following the Word of God. So, so actually Bible study was very important to your family's yes. life. And you would have family gatherings on a regular basis where you'd all read the Bible. Yes. And your parents or your father would conduct a Bible study with you and your yes. brothers? Yes. Okay. And what about the holidays? How did your family, John, spend the holidays? Uh, holiday was a, an excuse to get together. <laughs> an excuse. It didn't take much. And uh, my, my father and mother would cook. And uh, uh, well, we just loved getting together. Because uh, I had an older brother that, uh, by, by another mother. And so he stayed in Chicago. And on holidays, he'd come out. Well, actually, anytime he'd come out, it became a holiday. And uh, we used to just love getting together and meet and greet. And we loved when the out-of-towners came into town. So any excuse to get together was, was a holiday, everything. And, and these gatherings mostly took place out here in, in uh, Kankakee County? Yes. Yes, we were the country cousins. You were the country cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and Ida, um, how was the holidays for your family? I think it was pretty much the same. We would have gatherings um, on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays. The family would get together and we'd just sit on the porch, have conversations. I mean, it was really nice. And doing the, the regular holidays as well. And was your church community a large part of your uh, holidays? Yes, yes it was. Now, since the two of your high school sweethearts, Ida, what, what are some uh, memories that you remember about the two of you when you were just in high school for holidays? Um, I remember um, holidays, the basketball games, you know, just uh, spending the time, just spending time together, doing uh, the different events that school was having. Do you have a favorite memory of, of the holidays when, when uh, you and John were in high school together? They all were great. <laughs> they all were great. And um, John, what do you recall about that time? Uh, the football games. Uh, we would stay over from school because we never, neither one of us had a ride home. So if you go home on the bus, you can't get back out. I so we we stay over. You'd always have food. <laughs> My mom worked at the uh, school. She was a janitor at the yeah. time. So I would stay over more or less and help her with her work. And then after, you know, uh, we would finish with the work, we would go to the game away. Yeah. So that's where, that, that's where that actually fam family tradition started. If, you, if I wanted to see her, we had to make sure all the work was done. <laughs> I just yeah. thought about that. And then uh, we go to the uh, park. And uh, actually, I didn't really know you then. I knew the uh, fella that we both, we both knew. And they, they, they knew she'd always have food. So that's how I found out. <laughs> <laughs> and we just get to talk, we just got to talking, and uh, it started from there. The mistrust started. I was from the city, so she couldn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> she must have gotten over it by now. <laughs> <laughs> Long time ago. Uh, <laughs> be. Now, when y'all aren't working here or busy with your family responsibilities, John, what are some of the hobbies or interests that you have? Well. I, well, I used to have hobbies, but ever since, I, pretty much since I've been married, uh, anytime I wasn't with my family or, or, or working to make a living for the family, I spent doing community service. And what type of activities do you really enjoy doing in the community? Oh, man. Working in the garden for the seniors. Uh, I've learned to uh, spend time with the mayors and supervisors, who's ever in leadership roles try to help them work the programs out, uh, create programs, because I, I, I learned early, uh, just like I was saying about we had to help her mother in order to, for her to have free time, uh, it was the same thing with the kids. If they wanted to leave the yard or somebody wanted to come there and play, they, my kids always had chores like I had, so they had to help them in order for them to get free time. So th we built from that and realized that anything our kids, we wanted them to be, 
the, the whole community had to be. So uh, that's what got us started with community service. Uh, and realizing that uh, even though we are from the farm, we realize that not all people want to farm or are interested in farming. So we, uh, we did some looking around to see what their interests were and encourage them in the way that they want to go. Right. And at the same time, ensuring that it was a constructive events and activities they were doing. So you have a lot of young people in the community, some of whom um, have the opportunity and the interest in farming, but then you have other young people leaving the community because perhaps they don't see that there's anything here for them. Right. And, and so one of the, it sounds like if I understand, one of the activities that you have been really involved with is giving the youth other opportunities or giving them other ways of looking at things. Other way of looking at things and developing their skills as well. And then, of course, you'd right. like to keep them all here in the community, I sure. imagine. Yeah. Well, that was, that's kind of the ultimate goal, but in order, we feel like in order to keep them, you got to first let them go. And, and what we mean by that is give them a chance to grow into who they are, like my father did with us. You know, and so we couldn't hold nobody else's kid or even think about that. You know, first let them grow into what they is, and hopefully there's enough uh, magnetism left here, you know, whether they, ne they never leave or they at least come back and help build it for the next generation. Yeah, very good. Well, those are some really lofty goals. Um, what in particular, Ida, do you do when you're not really busy with your family and, and with your farm responsibilities? Do you like to knit or sew, or, or is there any particular hobbies that you have? I, I like to sew. You like to sew? I like to cook. Uh, I also spend lots of time <laughs> working on newsletter, community newsletter. Mm, uh, true. And, and which is, is something new for me for the last, what, three to five years maybe. But I, I like it because it share, it's about sharing information. So I, I, you know, focus on that a lot. Okay. And um, was there a particular time in which, Ida, that you and John, after you got married, um, that you were not living here in um, the Kankakee County area? Yes. And what was what was that like, and, and what were you doing at that time? We lived in Mississippi, um, very interested in farming, because we realized early on that um, food, when we know where it comes from, is, is healthy for our children. So we wanted to buy and purchase land, and we tried to there. Uh, we couldn't find any land there, so we really didn't know what to do from that. And with the guidance of John's dad, uh, we found land here, uh, so it was an uphill battle to get here. Uh, the family was separated for quite some years uh, as the men folks went off to find the land uh, uh, and uh, protect what whatever resources they they got when once they found it. Okay, so we stayed home and they provided a way for us here. So right down the street, my husband had bought uh, a greenhouse, but because of the fires here. Uh, the, the house got burnt down, and I think it was in 95. Uh, and we was just about to move in. It was, they did some uh, reconstruction in it, and uh, we was just about to move in. A big fire came through and, and burnt the house down. So that delayed things a little bit for us. Uh, but it took a couple more years. You know, in 98 is when we finally got an opportunity to move here. At the encouragement of my father-in-law again, who said that it's best for young people to be in the country where they can learn responsibilities. Uh, so you give them chores and all that kind of stuff, which we did. Uh, and um, we think that they're healthy, sound young people with uh, good, great work ethic. And and um, um, back to the, the fires, I, I, can you explain, was, did you know what, what caused the fires? Just there were fires around here? Oh, wow. Uh, what we know for sure is uh, there's usually a fire every summer, at least one. But in 95, the particular year when we lost our home, uh, there were fires started in Four Corners. Were these fires caused by something natural like lightning, or were they arson, or uh, what was the cause of these fires? We don't, we don't ever know. Uh, nobody never really looks into it that we know of. But uh, we do know that they happen just about every year. Uh, some years we lose people's homes. That some people have lost their lives. Equipment. Uh, yeah. I always lose the equipment because, uh, I mean, if, if, if you farm, uh, well, I guess when most people think of a farm, they think of a 
big house with a great big barn, all the equipment is inside of it. Well, here, uh, there's no big house and uh, there's no big barn, but you still have equipment which be away from the house usually and uh, weeds grow up around it. When, you know, once you lay, set everything aside, I mean, the weeds grow up, okay? So at the wrong time of the year, if you get a fire, well, with having the weeds, go along with the weeds. And, and that's, is that a pretty typical thing um, when you came from in Mississippi where people leave their extra equipment out on their land in different places? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that you're very comfortable with, but unfortunately sometimes if there's a fire, then of course the equipment gets burned. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, which, that fire was never a problem in Mississippi. Right. You know, uh, I never knew a fire, you know. It's just here, only place I know about where well, there's fires this frequent it is Simpson, I mean, not, not Simpson County, but right here, good old Hopkins Park, Pembroke. Yeah. This is the place where this seems to happen the most right, often. Right. So there's a lot of thoughts and no proof. I see. Now, John, you uh, were raised up here in Illinois, and then as a young uh, teenager, you went down to Simpson County, which is where your kids are from, your father and all. What were some of the differences or similarities that you noticed between life here in, in uh, Kankakee County and and down in Simpson County, Mississippi? Well, here, uh, people were pretty distant. Uh, we were blessed out here. When we, when we moved out here, they more laid back country people. And uh, which most of them, which, which was funny, was either from the city or from the South. So I had sort of a close relationship with just a few people because uh, my father didn't allow us just to go. He had to know him, and pretty much to see him, we had to be doing a chore there, and so uh, that that limit where we could go, you know, unless we wanted to uh, get a whipping, and I never was into that. And um, did did you um, experience any uh, challenges or, or other things that you had to overcome uh, when you came from Illinois to Simpson County? Oh wow! Now that that I mean, even though the South is a breath of fresh air. At the same time, it's when we first met Vince, people are prejudiced, okay, you know? But the, uh, I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but that's the way I've seen it. The good thing about being in the South is, you know they're prejudiced. They don't mind letting you know. They got all the emblems, and so it's not a hid thing. You know where not to be, you know what time not to be there, Whereas here, I found out once I get back, there's prejudice here. But you won't never see it. All you ever see is a smile. But at the same time, there's certain places they don't want you. Certain places you better not be. And uh, I don't know, no small town outside of Pembroke that really want anybody in there after you get a certain time of the day. And uh, whereas that's where we spend our money. But once we spend our money, it's for us to go home. If you don't, if you if you hang around at all, even now, if you hang around at all, you will be stopped. You will have a problem. I see. Now, do you feel compared to here that when your time in Simpson County was, um, the people in general respected each other's property and all? I'm thinking about the, about the fires. You said that it was typical to leave your your equipment out, and you didn't have that uh, situation. Do you feel that there was more or less respect uh, for people down in Simpson County? Uh, the people in the South yours? are more respectful, period. Uh, and the people that we met here that my father allowed us to be around, they were from the South. So uh, it, it's, it's that once people knew us here, once we pl was planted here long enough to where they had respect for my father, then, uh, okay, well, he didn't really have a problem other than the wildfires, okay? But down south, uh, there was a respect for equipment and people, period. So uh, we didn't have to, that was nothing we had to earn or gain. That's just something that was. I mean, he, the, 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 the only real problem was, like I said, the prejudice. You know, mm -hmm. it took us some getting used to that. But you know? people recognized if you owned a piece of land or owned a piece of equipment that that belonged to right. you and, and they leave it. Right. I see. It stayed where you put where you put it. I see. Now, Ida, you grew up down south in in Rankin County in Mississippi in Simpson County. I'm sorry, I keep mm -hmm. making that mistake. Um, 
And how were, how was, what was the experience for you to come up to the north for the first time and actually settle down and live here? It was totally different. You know, it was really totally different. Um, I'm from, it's a small town, small area. People pretty much know everyone, uh, speak and all that, really good to each other. But when I first moved up here, it was like I didn't know anyone. I got lost a few times. It was really, it was scary for me. It was totally different, but but I, I managed, and I'm, I'm grateful. But it was totally, totally different. So a very different experience. Now, I imagine in your hometown, maybe people had known each other for generations, if not for 100 years, mm -hmm. the families had all known each other. Right. So that was a very different experience. You came here, and everybody was unfamiliar to you. Right. And how was the winters up here? They're cold, they're freezing, but they're okay. I mean, you prepare for them. We're farmers. We expect, and we're in the north, so we expect to be for it to be cold and, and snow everywhere. And sometimes early on when we first got here, it was difficult to leave out in and out of these roads. Uh, my husband and my sons got stuck right around the curve after someone else had gotten stuck and they had abandoned their car. In order for them to get through the little narrow path, they would have to go around. And as they tried to go around the car, they got stuck. So they had to dig themselves out around the car just to come on home. I see. So now, it's really um, cold. Now, now, I've been in Mississippi a few times myself, and I know in the country a lot of the roads are dirt also. Um, what was the difference between driving around up here in Kankakee County in Mississippi? Was, was there something about the weather that made it different? Yeah, I think so. When it was ice, was there any ice, people just stayed home. Down that was south, the most, right. down south. That was the most dangerous time for, for us down south. We stayed home. We knew that it was dangerous out there. And we didn't get that much. We didn't get any snow. Mostly we was affected by the ice. But now up here, we're so used to having cold weather so many months of the year, <laughs> you feel like people probably are more out and about. They are. They are. It doesn't stop anyone. I mean, and now that they clean the roads really well, the school system is not shut down or anything like that. People go to jobs and all that kind of thing. Okay. So all right. Um, well, um, I'd also like to ask you one last question about um, what were your early years um, here once you got your place and set up? You mentioned a little bit about it. Um, how did I know that John, your family already had their uh, foothold in this area, but how was it for the two of you as a married couple just starting out once you finally got your place and, and you were um, put, get, put in your fences and getting your crops ready or your, and bringing in your stock? How was that the first year or three? Well, it, it was pretty rough. Uh, like I said, it, it, with, with people, even though my, they knew my father here, uh, and I was considered my father's son, uh, that made it a little bit better. Uh, but things are just hard around here, period. I mean, uh, it's just almost impossible for a person to get started in farming uh, that came from farming. I mean, they don't have a boatload of money. Uh, if you retire from the city, well, you're usually leaving the house. You have a retirement pay. You have all this. So when you leave that house, you're also selling it. So you come here, you have a nice little knot to put in the bank. Okay, uh, so you get instant access. You may get the best land, the best house. You build any house you want. Okay, but if you don't have that, you don't come from that, you come from a, long, a family, of a, a small income, uh, uh, subsistent, uh, that's a new word we learned, subsistent farmers. <laughs> I hate that name. <laughs> then you, you don't, what you usually have is where you done tried to create and maintain a business, that's what a farm is, if, if for it to actually work, is a business. And uh, like I said, if you, businesses, the only way they exist over time is they get infusions of money. I mean, nobody's so bright to where they don't need a loan every now and then. The expansion, uh, to maintain, uh, you have a bad year, you, to hold you over. Okay, well, if you're a subsistence farmer, uh, that's a joke, because you ain't got none of that coming. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> let me let me clarify that point about subsistence farming. Um, would you agree with this um, d explanation of it? My understanding is that, that that's a very traditional form of farming that's been practiced for generations mm -hmm. and generations. 
where a family has a place and they raise enough to take care of themselves and a little extra that they right. sell for cash or right. trade for other things they need. W would you say that describes your family? Yes. Okay. And then um, in terms of, of money, you were mentioning sometimes a, a small farmer like yourself needs a little loan. And also you've mentioned how there were some challenges when you first started. Where, where was your source of, of uh, money when you needed a loan? How did that uh, work out for you? Well, early on, uh, my father, like I said, had been here so long that he had helped so many people that uh, they would see us struggling and they would help us. Uh, I did so many things in order to feed us when, we, when I first got here. Uh, I used to have a, a bread route and they called me the sweet man because when I came through, hey, they knew I had the sweets. And so everybody would come out and run it. Well, I, I met quite a few people that way. And they would consider, they, they would adopt us. And uh, so that means we go to all the fam their family function, you know, because uh, we was away, she was away from her family. And it turned out that everybody I knew, for some reason, from the South too. And so they know what it would like to be from down there. So we was invited to all their family functions. And uh, my family was is so stretched out. I mean, we had people in Atlanta, uh, Mississippi, even now, uh, Chicago, Gary, you know, and, and Ohio, and if I probably could keep going, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't take it too long. And so, so um, those people would would uh, be available at different times to to loan you small amounts of yeah. money. I mean, I wouldn't have to ask. Once they seem to struggle, uh, they would do what they could do. I mean, but that's not like going to a bank. Mm -hmm. Go to the bank, you go there for what you actually need. Okay. I see. So it's an informal system of, of borrowing and lending money and, and maybe bartering and trading for things as uh, well? Plenty of barter and plenty of trade. Okay. Yeah. And, and tell me, you, you did tell me before a story about how when your father first was out of the service, he's a veteran of World War II. Yes. And how he first came out here. If I recall correctly, there was a, a neighbor lady who owned land, maybe even this piece we're sitting on right now, and she wanted to sell it. And Did she provide him for the same type of financing? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, he had known her for quite a few years. Um, my mother wasn't too happy about the idea, but uh, she let him work her land, okay? And her name was Peaches. And uh, so uh, that's how he got his start, and then he, he knew Miss Ireland, who owned this place, not that we, yeah, that we own now. And uh, so she uh, let him have his first acre. I mean, not have, but she let him buy it from her. So on time, she, she arranged for him to finance right. it so that he could, through work, he could buy the land from her. Right. And so he, uh, he, he, started, he, he was a builder. Uh, mm -hmm. So as far as some of your early challenges when you were first married and first up here working, it sounds like um, aside from the usual uh, concerns of getting yourself started and getting your stock and your crops and all going, you also had the um, need for small loans. And, and um, what other, were some of the other challenges that you recall from your first few years? Uh, equipment. Uh, even the, some of the best ideas with... Uh, kind of hard to achieve if you don't have a certain kind of equipment. Uh, the only blessing we had was there was a lot of us. So we could do what people thought couldn't be done. Because when we started a job, we just did it. So did it. with we a lot of labor, hands yeah. to help, you, you just worked your way yeah. through it. Actually, we worked our way through the neighborhood. And so I got to be known as the fellow with all the kids. <laughs> yeah. You know, So if you want a job, you want it done, call on him. Other than being the sweet man, the bread man, I also became the meat man. Because once I started processing my meat, I did it legally in a processing facility, USDA certified, and I had a license. Well, I still get And uh, so I was able to sell uh, processed meat. So I had a lot of hounds, you might say. A lot of, a lot of calves, I think they call it. I wear a lot of calves. Um, in 99, 98, 99, we did some research on, uh, along with USDA, in an effort for them to help the minority farmers. The research was done on uh, helpful ways to help farms 
small farms be more sustainable. Um, we went to on some trips to um, Ohio. Ohio and Minnesota and, and found this new way that they are calling it free range poultry. Uh, with the help of the Catholic Catholic campaign, for human, campaign development. for human development, Catholic community ch of churches. Uh, we got assistance to uh, to do the research here on this farm. We had a field day here uh, and all of that. Yeah, some of the buildings are still there. So it was uh, a chicken house. We were really excited about that. Uh, it was really helpful for us. And as he mentioned processing the poultry at the license facility. Uh, through that uh, that effort, we were able to find that license facility there in. Um, Arthur, mm -hmm. Illinois. Uh, so I just wanted to mention the fact that, you know, early on in maybe 95, no, 98. Later on. Later on in mm -hmm. 98, we did get a, assistance from the Catholic community who believed in us, and I really do appreciate that, and also help it internationally. As you see the cows in, in the back, uh, we are uh, members of Pembroke Farm and Family. Uh, it is a, um, we are part of uh, Project Partners with Heifer International. Uh, they have made it possible for us to raise, have cattle on our property. Um, and the idea is we were, were given a bred heifer, and that bred heifer would then have the baby, and we would give that baby to some other family. We would keep the as cow. As a bred heifer. As a bred heifer. So we it's living would, long. We would keep the, uh, the female, the original placement, and another family would uh, t accept the, the bred heifer uh, the baby That's once a it's bred. That's great way to give each other a leg up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're really excited about that program, and we're so grateful to have that in the community. Right. So as my father would come here, he, he didn't, he didn't, it might have existed, but he didn't know anything about those that kind of thing. So, but being the next generation, uh, through the struggle, we learn a lot of things. Uh, we've worked some with USDA. We've got a USDA grant. Uh, We've learned that they, they're not quite forgiving. <laughs> you willing to but work with people? They, they were there, and uh, uh, we did a lot of work with them. Uh, this uh, high tensile perimeter fence, uh, I learned how to do that, working with them. Uh, and so did our children. Grant. Yeah. Oh, yes, they can, I can send them anywhere, and they can put it up for anybody. So that's uh, actually become a source of income if they want to do a fencing business yes, then, because they yes. can do high tensile fencing. Right. Uh, uh, we went to different... Uh, uh, schooling on like they have uh, pasture walks we learn different things so we also can set up pastures uh, we got we just blessed to do a lot of things uh, I have to say uh, in 99 uh, USDA was a blessing to us uh, also uh, we learned about uh, 4 H. And 4-H is, 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 it need to be everywhere. And everybody need to uh, make sure that they stay funded. With they like to lose some of their funding this year. And uh, then, uh, like you said, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, uh, Heifer International. Those are all things that uh, we consider blessings from the Lord because they came in just in time to save otherwise a pretty bleak situation. And, uh, Whereas they didn't really, we don't really learn a new way to do nothing, but we learned the new name for what we're already doing. And we've able to use that to say, okay, we're doing free range. Well, we always did it free range. I mean, we wouldn't put a chicken in a, a tight spot and, and expect to actually eat that afterwards. Uh, so it wasn't, we had no problem with the concept. So it was right, right up our alley, you might say. Mm -hmm. So we had no problem with it. Okay. But those, we were blessed by those different organizations. And again, this year, I was telling you earlier today, we're uh, also blessed to have two summer vistas. Four. Well, I'm sorry, four. four. No, we had two summer vistas that work with the organization, the Communication Outreach Committee. Right. And we have four youth summer, summer worker. youth workers. Yeah. Are those your kin, or are they also um, people that are just having a farm experience? Uh, what, tell well, me more about that. I think this is the third year that uh, there is a summer youth works program in the community where young people have opportunity to work like eight weeks or so during the summer. And these young people range in age from uh, 13 to 22. And they do community service 
activities. They do brutification uh, and okay, brutification in our area and get gain work experience. So we're blessed to have four that work on the farm here. Uh, they have just recently uh, tore down a fence that has been up for like 10 years. They have uh, created a new fence, an electrical fence, just down the street where we'll soon be moving the cattle to. That's a very good experience. Now, I presume that most of these young people come from more urban areas? Uh, within the area, Hopkins Park. Okay, so this is part of the Sun local Hopkins initiative Hopkins. that you mentioned Sun, earlier. Yes, Sun River Terrace, maybe. Uh, Moments, maybe. Okay, very good. All right, well then, um, I think that probably we'd like to get a good look at, at your place, and maybe you can walk around and, and show me a bit more of okay. it. Okay. We're here on the farm in Kankakee County in Pembroke Township of John and Ida Thurman, and it looks like we're getting ready to move their cattle from one field to another. The family's all gathered around to help move the cattle so that they stay in the path where they'd like them to go. So maybe just a moment here, and we should be seeing some cows coming up the road. Mookie, Mookie. Harry, baby, Harry. Yeah. Well, Ida, you caught your breath <laughs> after all that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was interesting. So that's moving the cattle to the... Now, can you tell me a little bit more about moving the cows? Um, they were down in one pasture where we were, and now you're moving them up here because... <laughs> uh, we consider that the chicken farm. So when it gets tall, and the, and the chickens that we normally have there uh, finish eating it down as far as they can. We put the cattle there. So we moved them here. As you can see, that this has got uh, quite a, a bit of foliage, so we'll let them stay here for maybe a week or two. And then we'll put them back in the back where we're uh, mending fences back there as well. So you're rotating for grazing? Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Ida, we've got that job done and <laughs> got our breath back. It's a lot of work running around for a few minutes chasing after a bunch of cows. Um, I'm looking out at your land, which is behind you, and then even the road right along beside you. Um, I noticed that you've got a gravel on this road, and there's been some improvements here. I'm wondering how that's affected your land values, and, and um, have you been able to expand, and, and how are prices in terms of the land? When we first moved here, uh, the land was very cheap, maybe five, six hundred dollars per acre. And uh, over the course of years, uh, it has recently gone up to as, as much as uh, recently twenty five hundred dollars an acre, and it's, and it's increasing. The improvements of the road is about uh, two years ago, we got this gravel put on the road, which is quite helpful because uh, during the spring of that year, people were getting stuck in, in the mud. so. Uh, it's been a great improvement, but at the same time, the property value is going up. Uh, the taxes are going up. So, so while your land's increasing, you're um, getting improvements to your uh, local area in the township here, but then you're also seeing an increase in taxes. 
How's that affecting you for your bottom line um, in terms of, of uh, raising your stock and, and marketing them? Uh, it, the fact is we, we pride ourselves in try just attempting to hold on to what land we have. We look to expand. As you see, we have cattle, and the idea is to fence in the large areas so that they can primarily feed off the land. Uh, that's our sustainability component where we move the animals from uh, paddock to paddock. Uh, it's very difficult to expand for that reason. I see. And and I get the impression, Ida, that you own uh, pretty much all the acres. Do you, do you rent any acres or do you strive to own all your land? We rent at this point uh, a two five acre spot. We also barter land. Um, uh, and with that, we uh, raise our, lot our vegetables. Uh, we uh, barter for a hay production, which I said earlier today that uh, they had just uh, brought in the hay and we're putting in our little self-made barn uh, and we'll use that, that hay for the winter for the cattle. So, the so you've got a combination of land that you own, land that you rent, and land that you barter, barter for. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, I was wondering about the organic farming. Um, how does that fit with your ideas and with your program of, of uh, running your farm business? It has always been out. We have always raised uh, livestock and vegetables organically, though we didn't know the name was organic. But it's just a way of life for us. Uh, and we just, we think that this is the most cleanest way to uh, raise our vegetables. We know what's going into it. We know what's going into the hay uh, and the grasses that are on our farm. So we just think it's a, a benefit. We know what's going into our body. Okay. And how does that affect your bottom line, that you're organic farming rather than maybe more traditional farming with where you're using a lot of chemicals and fertilizers and so forth? The thing is about uh, what we do is we we don't get the, the high end that uh, others get because we raise organic. We sell our uh, vegetables uh, just reasonable so that it's affordable. And um, tell me about the demand that you have. Is there at the marketplace since you're raising organic? There's been a trend in the country uh, nationwide for uh, people wanting these products, and they're adding value to the farmer. What type of experiences have you had with organic um, in terms of uh, coming to the market? Uh, it's in high demand. Wherever we go, people are asking, you know, where we're going to be at so that they can participate. They consider us their farmer. So it's, it's a demand uh, for good, wholesome food. Uh, but we don't, we don't, we really don't put it out there that we're organic. We are sustainable. You know, we are natural. We, we raise and we explain. We take our time to explain to our customers how we raise our, our foods, you know, and they really appreciate that. So uh, they, it's, a, it's a demand for it. Even organic that I hear about, it's a, it's a demand for it, and that's a good thing because we are so close. I mean, we are organic, but we, don't, we aren't certified organic, and we don't have the certificates and things like that. But uh, once we explain to them how we do what we do on our farm, they really appreciate our care. So do you have occasionally have visitors, potential customers, who come out and have a look at your place? Oh, yes. Uh, we have people that come out and buy the chicken, the poultry, and the goats. Uh, we have had farm tours, and we're gearing up to have farm tours again. And who are some of your typical customers who'd come on out and, and want to see your chicken and goats? Uh, African, the African uh, community, uh, Asian, come out and, and buy the chickens. Uh, and just the, sen the seniors who uh, may live in the city at this point and remember what it was like for them growing up on the farm. So they enjoy coming out. And those people live in the city of Chicago? Yes. And about how far are we located from Chicago? Uh, depending on what part you're going to, you know, I would say 65 or maybe more miles. So by car, maybe about an hour's drive? Hour and 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, so you've got a lot of interest in, in organics in general, and then you've got a, a niche group that's interested in, particularly in your... Um, goats and in, in your uh, chickens. Mm -hmm. Did you say you also raise meat rabbits on your place? Yes. Uh, daughter, uh, Veronica, has now uh, claimed responsibility for those. She monitors and manages those, the goats. Okay. I mean, uh, rabbits, yeah. 
Okay. And, and what, what kind of a market do you have for your rabbits? At this point, we're developing a mar market for those. And your daughter Veronica is in charge of the rabbits, mm -hmm. and she's thinking, give me some ideas about what are her marketing plans? Uh, she she uh, educating uh, people about how to raise them first and foremost. Uh, and then her plan is to uh, find a place to market them. We uh, process them. Um, we used to rely on Arthur uh, Illinois, the Central Illinois Processing Facility, but we come to find out that they don't process birds anymore. So, I mean, uh, rabbits. So, we're hoping that you know, once she get her production up, that she can just sell them straight out. So you'd like to do some direct marketing yeah. then. Um, can you tell me a little bit, you mentioned there are people that come out to your farm and have a look and then also certainly local communities are familiar with you since you live here. Where are some other places that you regularly market your products? Um, we are part of a, a group called Pembroke Farming Family. As a group we market uh, produce in Kankakee, um, Country Club Hills, um, Austin community. Is that in Chicago, in the Chicago. Austin community? Mm -hmm. So it's a neighborhood in Chicago? Mm -hmm. And uh, here recently, the spring, we were talking about uh, going to Inglewood. Okay. And there are other markets there that have uh, invited us to come. So we're looking forward to participating in all the markets that we can as a group. It's about 16 of us. Okay, so, so it sounds like these are farmer's markets? Yes, they are farmer's markets. Okay, and so about how many days a week are you on the road marketing, say during the summer months? Uh, I would say four, four, yeah, because there are different communities, different groups go, different families, farm families go at different times. And we're also in the process of developing a farmer's market right here in uh, Hopkins Park. So we're looking forward to that as well, and that would be on a Friday. And in addition to that particular group that you belong to um, here in, in uh, Pembroke, are there other uh, organizations, farm organizations, um, for example, Cooperative Extension that you belong to or are involved with in, in Kankakee County? Yes, we are part of uh, University of Illinois Extension, Kankakee County. Uh, we are on the council of uh, with the Extension, and we really feel good about that because it allows us the opportunity to promote Extension and all its programs. And, and tell me a little bit more, what's Extension for those of us that are kind of unfamiliar with it? Extension is a, uh, connected with the uh, University of Illinois out of Champaign-Urbana where different programs are offering from economic development to uh, positive youth development and 4-H. Uh, um, it's just an array of, of different programs that are being offered. They have uh, participation in the fair, they have uh, home economics and uh, um, let's see. You learn things like also covering things like budgeting and, and farm and family finances. Sure. Right. So it offers a lot of support, it sounds like. And you're on the board of that organization? We are ex uh, Extension Council. Council and, and explain what is the Extension Council well, we, and what do you exactly do with that? We uh, have um, meetings um, to go over the budget of Extension and give our, our suggestions if, if the, we have some, just to keep, you know, to say that we're part of the community, we're part of Extension, and, and we look at things that are, that are doing and all the programming and, and, and ensure that these programs are sufficient for the community, the entire Kankakee County. And how much value do you feel that you've gained over the years from your uh, participation with, with Cooperative Extension? Oh, I've, I've, learned so, I've learned so much. I just can't express how much I've learned since I've been a part of this. Um, before I came here, you know, being from the South, I, I didn't have that many opportunities to learn and be so close to how things work. But here, you know, there's the opportunity. And, and if you would like to be an extension, uh, a p part of the council, anyone could be a part of this uh, uh, council. Uh, just go to the extension and let them know that you're interested. And when the time comes up for uh, new council members, then they'll let, let you know you know how you can become a part of it but it's really an exciting interesting thing to learn about how this agritourism and that's another thing we're part of the ag agritourism component whereas we're working to have a barn quick tour uh, where people would be uh, barns that are 50 years or older would be uh, there would be a tour to come around and look at these barns and, and learn a little history about it so 
being a part of this University of Illinois Extension is really educational. You find out how things work, uh, and you can help by utilizing uh, your own. So that's even another yeah. way to truly add value to your place is by agritourism. Uh, yeah. Yes. And and so you, in addition to having potential customers coming out, you've got just people that just would like to see rural lifestyles. Right. Right. And and um, what's been your experience so far with with agritourism? Um. I, I think it, it's great. I think that it's a great way to promote farming. Uh, like I said, we've had a few few tours. We're getting things together so that we can even do more. Uh, it's just a wonder to see young people and older light coming out to see what's on your farm, to see uh, participate, to see animals just running around. It's really exciting to, to see the, the laughter and the joy of the young people. And sometimes the, the, the stench that they, uh, <laughs> complain about and all those different kinds of things. It's all good though because it's a part of nature. Okay, and then tell me a little bit for us novices who've never raised uh, cattle in an organic, more traditional fashion. Um, so many of us today rely on feedlots and that's our agriculture experience. What's a brief uh, overview of your year with your cattle? Do you, you buy feeder cattle? And you mentioned a very interesting program where you um, donate a bred uh, heifer to someone. Okay. Um, how does that work for you, the whole year cycle? We have a placement heifer. She's bred. It stays on the farm. It comes to the farm. It stays on the farm. She has her baby, her uh, cow, calf. Um, if it's a, a, a heifer, then we raise it on the farm. We utilize the bull to breed her. Then when we sure that she's bred, that female will then be placed with another farm family in the community. We then are allowed to keep the, 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 uh, the placement, the first placement, we keep her. And then from that, we've done our pass on. So the other families um, would get the cattle as we just talked about, I just talked about, but she's ours. Um, and they all have the opportunity to raise it in the same way, and we pass it on and on. So it's a pass one on kind of situation <laughs> where yes, everybody ends up in the end with an extra cow that they didn't have in the beginning. Right. And then um, talk a little bit more, if you will, Ida, about your farm cycle, because I, I don't see any feedlots, and okay. I don't see any silos or silage or anything on your place. How do, how do you feed your cattle? Do you, do you sell them to market, or do you always keep some on the place? Um, because this is this is a, a new in the program, uh, we move our cattle from from paddock to paddock. We don't have a feed lot. We just move them around, and uh, market time. Once we're just trying to build up, build up right at this point. Uh, following the build up, then we will sell them at the markets, our halves and things like that. So you're working to increase your um, your uh, number of head you have. Sure. Right. And because you're organic, I would imagine that not having a feed lot, you don't have all that extra um, equipment and structures that you don't need that. And I imagine that really help your bottom line. Right. Um, the, the thing is, uh, we are now bothering to get hay cut. And uh, even though it would be more convenient at this point to have our own equipment, we have found ways to move around that. And we do uh, get the hay cut and uh, it's, he it's brought here and this way we know uh, what the cattle are eating and it's hay and it lasts throughout the year, the winter time. Do you need to routinely during the uh, warm growing months, do you find that you need to routinely supplement your uh, pasture with hay or do you have enough grass for your cattle? We utilize the hay that, you know, if, if they run out, if they run out on a paddock, we may supplement them, yes, because we don't want them to run out. <laughs> uh, but we do. We try very hard to know where we're getting our hay from at all times. And so so primarily you're hoping to have enough hay to overwinter. Yes. Okay. And um, some other things I've been wondering about since I came out here today, I, I was wondering a little bit about, um, more about um, uh, disease control. Do, do you have a lot of problems with, with d diseases on, with your you livestock? No, actually we don't. I, I don't, I, I'm, we're blessed. We don't have that many diseases. We keep them moving around. Uh, let's build up on different, you know, paddocks. So that's the idea, to keep things moving around so that you won't have a build up and you won't have a problem. So that's what we do. Well, that's very interesting. And it does seem like it's a very efficient and very economical way to raise uh, beef. 
How about the taste of the beef when they're raised just on grass? Well, from it, the, the beef is, is uh, more or less a little firmer than what you would expect, more bite. Yeah, so. Uh, but it works out because we know that, that these animals are, are getting grass. You know, and that's what we want, grass fed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're okay with it, and we just hope that our customers, and once we start marketing, they'll be okay with it too. Yeah, and I know that again, there is a trend in this country going towards more grass fed because the cost of feeds and other things that are skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that you're part of that trend. Um, some last few things I'm wondering about um, that we just touched on earlier was. Um, the uh, impact of, of the rural co-ops, you talked about a little bit about your involvement with the Pembroke Farmers Group that you have mm -hmm. and then also with uh, Cooperative Extension. Are there any other groups that, that you've been involved yes. with and, and um, what's been the effect on those groups in terms of the whole community from, from your point of view? We are a part of uh, another organization called the Communication Outreach Committee of Pembroke Options Park. Uh, this group is so important to me because it's a collaborative of all that make up the community, whether it's the businesses, the churches, the regular people, uh, uh, everyone come together and, and, and realize that we are all working together for this community, whether we create the farmer's market in our local area, whether we uh, create youth groups, and uh, again, I say 4-H, we, we, we brought 4-H into this organization because 4-H is about everyone. It's an opportunity for, for us to be adult volunteers within uh, this uh, community and in order for us to get the word out more about this opportunity for young people. We've, we said, you know, Communication Outreach Committee, would you adopt this program as one of yours? And we're offering it to all young people in the community. Uh, we also uh, uh, get an attempt to get uh, businesses in the community to work together to realize that yeah, the farmer's market is the first step. Let's all work together and uh, we're promoting this one entity. We're working together to do that. Now, if there are local crafters or uh, organizations who want to sell bakeries, uh, whatever, to sell at this farmer's market, that's just our first step. Now, where do we go from here to help us to realize business are an important part of our economic development? We should work all work together to expand them and, and move forward. And what about um, state and federal legislation? What impact has that had on your efforts to organize and develop your markets and, and your local community for economic development? Are you aware of anything like that? I, I just real I know that um, we are part of uh, we go to meetings and that's the best thing that I could say for anyone. When meetings are held in your area, go to the meetings and see firsthand what's going on because your input is important. You may have something to bring to the table. Uh, there is a uh, Team Illinois um, component here, a steering committee component. And going to the meetings, we realize the different things that can happen that are, are coming, to the, coming through to the community. So I, I just will say that uh, in building economic development or doing anything within the community, attend meetings so you can learn firsthand what's going on and possibly how you can um, uh, help building yeah. your own community. Now in terms of legislation, for example, I'm thinking about recently the Illinois legislature outlawed um, processing of horses in this state. So people who have horses that they might want to send up to, it was in DeKalb County for processing, they have no place to do that now. They either have to send them out of state or they're just stuck with them. Have you had anything like that that you're aware of, any type of legislation that's affected your farm directly or the way you do business or perhaps some health regulations that have been instituted? Uh, what I can say about that is the, the poultry processing. Um, in 99, the, the, uh, there was a limit on how many poultry you could, chickens you can process on your farm. Uh, that number was increased to 5,000 and that was really uh, beneficial for small family farms. Yeah. And then um, last of all, I'd like to ask you about um, your ideas about the role of education in agriculture. Um, how, how has uh, education in agriculture helped your family personally and, and in general for uh, people who are involved with agriculture? How important do you think education is? Uh, as my husband was saying earlier, 
uh, by going to different conferences and getting that further education that the University of Extension offers. It allows farmers an opportunity to realize what you're doing counts. Lots of us don't realize that we are utilizing those organic practices, but we think it's everyday life for us, so we don't think anything of it. But when you go to different educational components, you'll learn that what you do on your farm is important and, and uh, is needed. So I think education is very important. So for young people, would you recommend that they get some type of education, whether through a cooperative extension or even maybe through the community college if they're oh, thinking about farming? Definitely. And how about farm finances? Has that education made you more aware of different ways that you can uh, handle the finances related to your farm business? It's been helpful as well. It surely has. So, well, I thank you very much, Ida, and I thank your family for having us out and interviewing you today and looking over your place. Thank you.